Hey there, I'm Aaron Franklin, and you're watching BBQ with Franklin. Earlier this year, I had the chance to sit down with my friend Jeremy Yoder. You may know him as the Mad Scientist. We talked barbecue, barbecue, and more barbecue, had a good cup of coffee, and I hope you enjoy. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> uh, well, lots of stuff to talk about. One of the things was, like for me, when I was getting into barbecue, like looking online, there weren't a ton of resources really available. There were a couple websites or a couple blogs, and then there was the Barbecue with Franklin series. And so that was- Wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> <I'm just> exactly. <laughs> now I've totally like, heard of that. That was the barbecue Bible for me. And I was like, oh, this is, oh, I've been doing it completely wrong. Let me try it this way. That's so, really cool. I didn't, yeah, yeah I guess people watch the, that stuff. I never really followed up. I don't know for sure. I don't know if you're pulling my leg right now or... No, I really am. I'm super good at not following up on things. Oh, same. Like, we just put it out in the world and na 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 moved on to the next thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it's uh, it's taken on borderline mythical status at this point. But, yeah, so I know that for me, I would watch it and I watched all of them. I watched the PBS stuff even because I was just a sponge of information because I was so passionate about creating good barbecue that I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I didn't happen to live in Central Texas. And, yeah, you know, where you just absorbed it. Yeah, I was living in Los Angeles at the time and the tradition of barbecue there is not quite the same as it is in a place like this. And so that was my, you know, it was a place for me to tap into you know, the knowledge that people have passed on for, you know, one generation to the next generation here. Mm -hmm. And I looked at all those and it really also inspired me. And I think that maybe you don't realize how much of an inspiration you were for all those people. You know how when Elvis came along, it was now people have televisions in their home and yeah. he was everywhere. And he had kind of a unique place because... Well, and he shook his hips in a certain way, too. True. Yeah. But you shake your briskets in a certain way. So it's kind of the same thing. Tomato, tomato. Indeed. But for, for people who were cooking in their backyard and they wanted inspiration and they wanted some direction on how to do it, I mean, that show really kind of was the first one out there because it's when I started watching stuff on YouTube and YouTube was the source of information. So for... A lot of people cooking in their backyard. You were the original teacher. Well, that's very interesting. Ah. Huh. You learn something new every day. And now you have barbecue pits that you're making. So you gave some education with, first of all, that. And then you have the barbecue book, and the Meat yep, Smoking yep. Manifesto. Mm -hmm. And so between those two, you have like the knowledge to get started. And then what made you decide, okay, uh, I see that the uh, price of steel is... Climbing through the roof. Let's make some barbecue smokers. Oh my gosh. Well, so the barbecue pits, it took about five or six years to actually get to selling the first one. Um, and the process of designing little backyard cookers, and really it was just initially just trying to help out the little guy because there wasn't a good barbecue pit on, on the market then uh, that could do two or three briskets. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you buy some stuff, it's going to rust out. Um, but really, I wanted it initially to be cheap enough, just, you know, like kind of a little rat rod, just something, hmm. you know, that's pretty cool, pretty rustic. But as we kind of went down the rabbit hole of production and realizing that no one builds casters good enough for mm -hmm. us, no one, you know, build, can make the connections the right way. No one can make that smokestack collector exactly how I want it. Like there's no tooling for that stuff. So as we started getting into introducing robotics and cutting and lathing the, the stainless steel yolks for our casters, making our own casters, doing everything in house, which is super the Franklin way. Of course the cost went up, but that happened about the same time that steel prices pretty much tripled. Uh, so yeah. that, what I wanted to sell it for initially uh, was kind of based on like two cookers a week, just kind of, you know, real, real small scale. Mm -hmm. Um, but then now the actual cost of like our hard cost on a Franklin pit is more than three times what I originally wanted to sell it for like seven or so years ago. Yeah, exactly. uh, and it would have been 2014 is when I started working on barbecue pits. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? 
Yes, 2014, the summer of 2014. Wow. So it's been a while. Yeah. Um, so that's how long it took us to get here. <laughs> well, great barbecue <laughs> takes time, and I guess great pit building also takes time. Uh, apparently so. Uh, but yeah, I'm really proud of those cookers, though. I mean, looking at them, and you know, we were just up, up there. We, we build them in two places right now. Um, but just the way that we don't use pipes anymore because they're too out of round, the way mm -hmm. we press our own heads because the tolerances were too out of spec, um, like we really DIY that all that stuff, but it is a barbecue pit that'll last you a hundred years. I mean, they're so well put together. Yeah, yeah, I totally believe it. It seems like your attention to detail that made the restaurant successful and made people, you know, make <clears throat> pilgrimages from across the world. I think you kind of put that same mindset into every single little detail. I'm a details guy. Yeah, it shows. I noticed a lot of those things that I'd never really considered doing myself. Like I have a bunch of different smokers at home and the ones that are on casters never want to roll right. It's just a fight. Yeah. On concrete even. It's just a fight like get it just go to your go to your home. And you have to kick the little casters to yep. get them to to move over just right. Yeah, yeah, it's annoying. And these are the same things that frustrate us and even like the little details on the pits where like the handle spins and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like it's it's the little things. Yeah, yeah. And little things make big differences. They really do. You know, when you combine them all. And I have, if you don't mind, I have some questions about Oh, give design. it to me. Okay. So I, I may or may not have an answer. Okay. I, it's it's possible that I had an answer <laughs> and I've totally forgotten. Oh, I've been there. I've been there. Uh, my favorite is when people will quote something back to me that I said in a video that I don't remember. Uh -huh. I'm like, remember the time you said this? How come? I'm like, uh, yeah, oh, I may have I've, been thinking. I've had to look back at books to remember how to cook things yep. that I used to cook a lot. And you know, because <laughs> each thing, and that's the thing like about your videos too, is each video, like the BBQ with Franklin stuff, like we shot those almost 10 years ago. Yeah. A lot has happened in the last 10 years. Franklin Barbecue is a completely different restaurant than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. All these things have changed, but like each time that I do a video or do a book or do a master class or you do a video. That's what's happening right then. Right. It's not, things evolve so quickly yeah. and change that I think it, it's important to remember for us as well as anybody watching or, or looking at any of this stuff. It's like, oh, well, that's what they thought then or that's what mm -hmm. they did then. But you may have changed a week later. You may have stopped doing it that way and then totally forgotten or in my case, been doing it the same way for years. Be like, oh, I found a better way mm -hmm. through like the process of actually maybe doing a book. Or something yeah. like that, be like, oh man, I actually kind of prefer it like this. It's like when you play music and you finally go to the studio to record it and everybody like really hears their parts, mm -hmm. like, ooh, that note doesn't fit. I'm gonna play it like this. Like that's when mm. you really tighten things up in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, time and a place. And each, each thing's just a little like picture of a window in time. Right. Yeah, so I, I also have to go back and watch videos and be like, ah, what was that sauce recipe? I, <laughs> sure. I never wrote that down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point. I hadn't really thought about each video as a snapshot in time. You know, it's it's my thinking about a subject at that moment. But yeah, it's always evolving. Yeah, and but and those videos don't date, but everything else just keeps moving. Yeah, exactly. You know, I get older and those videos stay the same age. <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. With the design of the Franklin Pit, uh, I had just a couple questions. Um, one is that that plate that kind of comes out from the firebox. I don't know what you call the entrance from the firebox to the cook chamber. I call it the throat. Yeah, but, sure, whatever. But there's the plate that the water pan sits on. Mm -hmm. So I have cut out baffles from smokers. Mm -hmm. So the ones that go down, I immediately cut those out and I'm like, I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, and then like the ones that are pitched down a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm like, it inhibits the airflow. Has a hot spot right in the center of the grate. Don't like it. Um, but I've kind of adopted, I think I like no plate there at all. I want the hot gases to well, go immediately to the top. So I've, I've experimented a lot and mostly on the big ones, okay. you know, like I've been yep. building barb, I, the first one that I built when I came up with that smokestack collector situation, yep. like I built that on a piece of plywood on a trash can in my backyard nice. in 2010, early 2010, I guess. Um, and it's really just the idea of just thinking about something you want to design it from the inside. Right. So. Mm -hmm. That's where the collector came from, but that's also where the deflector plate, which is what we call it, mm -hmm. um, or a heat shelf or whatever, um, kind of came in. And when I was doing, I remember one of the first barbecue pits I did, it was one of the first thousand gallon cookers that I did after I did my first 500 gallon. 
is that I built this adjustable thing because sure. I just, you know, you don't really know until you get there. And it's kind of, you have to design something from the inside and you have to think about the airflow. But part of that airflow is, you know, you can't, you can only pull a fire. You can't push. That's why fans right. are terrible. That's right. why, you know, Agreed. I design barbecue pits the way I do to think like fire and think about how things are going to curl and move around and all this chaotic airflow or whatever vorticity happens in there. And you just got to kind of think about fluid dynamics with this stuff. But so say you build this big smokestack and then you've got this vacuum, right? You've got a mm -hmm. properly operating offset cooker. You got vacuum coming in, got a big firebox. You can build whatever kind of fire you want and get whatever flavors you need out of it and wood selection, all, all this stuff. But what, how that air hits it is what that deflector can do, right? Mm -hmm. So I built an adjustable one because I just didn't know. Like right. I thought it should be pitched down. I built one. I remember there was one that had a slide on thing that was pitched down like a wing, you mm -hmm. know, kind of like airfoil kind of ideas. Um, and then I would adjust it, but it had this, uh, all thread that went down from the bottom so I could go underneath and mid cook and I could turn a little thumb screw and I could move it up and down like an airplane mm -hmm. wing, right? Sure. Um, and then what, but what I learned was it didn't really matter. Mm. It didn't affect much because the airflow was so aggressive that it could make the heat kind of dip down, but eventually it had to work towards a smokestack, mm -hmm. obviously. So you just kind of guide it and decide where you want it to be. And I kind of landed on it being flat. Um, and I've also, cooked a bunch where I've cut them out or I've built barbecue pits and then fired them up and cooked on them before I actually added that piece just mm -hmm. to see. So I've tried it all, all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, what I decided, and this is why the Franklin pits are that way, it's because all the pits are like that at Franklin Barbecue as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's just flat, but I like it because if you're looking at, at a cutout, like a side view of, of a cooker, you got firebox, you've got this flat heat shelf, you got smokestack sticking up over here, you've got stagnant, less hot air up here, right? And then you've got this airflow that's going underneath. And what it does is it's like a bimetallic strip. It helps it helps create vorticity in there. So you're sucking mm. in a little bit of air from the door, which you want. Like you, it should be have a little bit of an air gap because that gives you a little safety zone for your thinner flats or whatever you're gonna put up there. But it helps the air start to spin and curl around the cook chamber. So when that heat shelf is there, it gives you a spot to put a water pan, yeah. which is cool. You, we're exhausting all kinds of moisture out of that cook chamber, mm -hmm. which you have to do to create a bark, but you also have to introduce new humidity to keep your RH right mm -hmm. uh, in that cook chamber to, you know, you can't just put out more than you're bringing in, you know? Um, so you've got that shelf there, good for water pan, but that airflow, the air is pulling through the firebox, the throat, as you like to call it, goes up and it starts to curl. So mm -hmm. then it's pulling in air from the door, so then it starts to spin. And that's where you get the high convection mm. of a Franklin barbecue pit, but that's what makes the bark. That's what gets you, dries out the surface in just the right way. That's kind of what helps you render the stuff. So if you take that heat deflector out, the heat just goes straight up and yep. it may go over here, it may just go up and it may kind of go up and then flub around a little bit. But I think like the, the pressure difference of that really helps that convection. Oh, okay. No, I think that makes sense. And it's also helpful too, I will add, not okay. to interrupt you, um, but we round, if you look at a Franklin pit, it's actually rounded on the bottom of it, so it mm. doesn't collect soot. Oh. Because you don't, because the because we kind of port and polish the insides of those pits for better airflow. Like they're built for crazy amounts of convection, mm -hmm. which is also why they turn on a dime, why you have to be so good at working a fire. Right. Because they're like, throw a little log and it's like, whoo, whoa, that took 30 seconds. You know, yeah. like they're, they move really quick, yeah. uh, which is good because yep. you need your cooks to move. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'd never really thought about it that way, but the way you explain it, I think that makes complete sense. Yeah. Because well, I just made it up on the spot, but well, it sounds good. This is, it's impressive then. Well done. Maybe you should run for office. But uh, no, I think that makes sense. Just like vortex of air. Um, I've noticed that. I mean, not that there's like a ton of CFM in there. So like, sure. the, the, you know, like rules of like aerodynamics don't necessarily apply to this because it's all a huge variable, but right. like just kind of the loose guidelines, I think. Yeah. Redneck uh, science. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that totally makes sense. I have another question and I was wondering what the process was that allowed you to kind of work through this. But one thing I've noticed is in backyard smokers, mm -hmm. offset smokers, it's almost always a problem of getting your fire not to die. So, well, so that is tricky. Yeah. Um, and that's really, I think the biggest part of learning how to work a fire yeah. and that what that comes down to is your wood selection. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got 
a big firebox, you're obviously gonna use larger pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. If you've got a small cooker, well, you need to use smaller pieces. And I think it's finding the right density of wood, and that just happens with experience. Mm -hmm. you, know, you pick up a piece and I'm like, oh, it's too heavy. Ooh, it's far too light. Well, this one's just right. Um, sure. You know, like wood selection. Uh, but also the, the pieces that you're gonna do because you have to find your cadence with a fire. Mm -hmm. And I think of a fire as like a good game of Tetris. You've got these little like pieces of wood coming down, mm -hmm. you know, they burn, they turn to coals, and then you rake the coals back. That's where a firebox are a little bit longer mm -hmm. than some other ones. It's because you wanna be able to keep a fire going, have the right amount of wood, and you wanna time it. So if you, have, if you need a log, like say every five minutes, then you want your log to replenish that coal bed at the same rate that you're putting on new wood. And when that, timing gets out of balance, that's when you kind of run out of coals or maybe you have too many coals and you don't get to introduce a new, you know, new fuel to the fire essentially. Sure. So that, you know, and I don't like to cheat it with airflow necessarily like fans or like dampers and stuff like that. Cause I think it's just kind of a weird crutch for, you know, it's an excuse to build a bad fire essentially. But, sure. you know, I think if you think about it in that way where you just have the proper cadence, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, piece of wood, coal bed, and it just keeps rotating like fire in, coals out and then ash towards the back of the firebox. But also building a fire like that comes in really handy when it's windy or when it's cold because you don't ever want your heat source on an offset cooker just to be a big fire. Mm -hmm. Like we're not getting much out of a big fire. Like we want the coals. We want that higher combustion temperature. Sure. But when you have that coal bed, you can get your combustion temperature up to like, I don't know, say 688 degrees or so. Um, so you so your fire is more water vapor than, you know, oil soluble particulate. Uh, mm. So then that play that factors in as well. Yeah. I just dug us down a, a little bit of a rabbit hole. No, no, that, that's totally, totally fine. This is tremendously interesting to me. And I think also for my audience, because like the deep thinking that you have to do to create really great barbecue and produce it consistently, not just, oh, some stuff fell together and it turned out great. Um, I think that's tremendously helpful yeah. for somebody who wants to, because if they're going to invest 12 hours cooking something, they want it to be something they're proud of at the end. Yeah. But if you're going to invest 12 hours, it's going to be 12 hours. Yeah. You know, there's no real shortcut totally. to doing it the right way. Like you can get pellet cookers and stuff and you can get pretty close, but like if you really want like that level of perfection, mm -hmm. also you, you know, at the same time you get a, a pretty good, uh, guarantee that you might mess something up. So mm -hmm. it's really, you very, never know. Very true. Another aspect of the design that I was curious about is the collector. So all of your pits have collectors. <clears throat> I've seen people advertise, oh, this thing has a Franklin style collector. Were collectors a thing before? I'd never seen one. Okay. I mean, I made it up in my backyard. Okay. Well, they're it everywhere just, It just seemed like the thing to do. Okay. <laughs> It was like, well, this makes sense because if the first barbecue pit I got, uh, the one that we started Franklin with was a 500 gallon size. It was mm -hmm. built on some farm somewhere. It's a terrible, terrible cooker. I've still got mm -hmm. it. It's named number one. <laughs> um, but it had the smokestack that was just a pipe that yep. terminated at the top of the tank. So in my head, you know, all the heat was just like, uh, and then just going right off the top. So it never went across the grate. So mm -hmm. my first welding, literally my first welding project, um, and you can see on the cooker, like every inch, the welding bead on that new smokestack is different. I'm like mm -hmm. changing the settings, try to put them looking at the manual that came with the Hobart. I'm like, oh, let's try this. <laughs> um, and they're terrible, but it doesn't matter. They don't have to look good. It's not um, going into space. <clears throat> But the first thing was like, oh, well, I got to make this smokestack go lower. So I lowered it closer to the grate to try to pull the heat across the grate. Um, but a huge difference. And that kind of got me thinking. It was like, well, why do I want it to go here and all this heat just like and shloop, go up like that? Mm -hmm. So it made sense to me. I, I like to build cars, by the way. I'm super into old, nice. old cars. Um, but it got me thinking about like an internal combustion engine. You know, mm -hmm. if you port and polish, you know, the valves, like, you know, for the heads, <clears throat> everything's rounded. If you think about like mm. exhaust valves and just how air flows inside of a carburetor, things are rounded. Like intake manifolds aren't just bloom, 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 like hard nineties, like mm. things don't like to move that way. So that's where I ended up with a smokestack collector and it's, you know, they're smooth outside welds. Everything's like ported and polished on the inside. Um, so just to try to get the air just to kind of go across and then from the stack, it can just go up. Doesn't mm. matter. It's already past the meat. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, that but makes that sense. creates the vacuum, and then that helps guide what all the other stuff does. Yeah, it's like an AC vent in a car. You just yeah. turn the flappers around and just guide it. 
Yeah, I view, and feel free to disagree with this, but I, I view what happens at the stack as kind of like, you know, when you're going into Disneyland or the subway or something, they have the little turnstile. Mm -hmm. And like, it regulates everything else. The other things will back up because of it, or things will flow freely because of it. But it's, uh, to me, like the, the, the one thing that regulates everything else that happens. And so it's important to get it right. Well, so I think of it as you've got this hard vacuum from a stack, mm -hmm. and then what's really regulating it is what you do with a firebox. Mm. So you can slow down your fires with a hard pull, or like it's cold outside, yeah. like smokers, big smokers pull a lot harder in the yeah. cold weather. Um, little ones probably do too, but just not on the same level. Yeah. Um, but what you do if you pick drier wood and you bog them down into the coals, you're regulating that airflow mm. with your firebox, but your pull's the same-ish. Uh, coming from it, so coming from the stack. So if you know, if you had like a firebox or a damper on the firebox, you could like pinch it closed and mm. still get a vacuum. You could still get clean air going in because it's sucking in clean air as opposed to to not. Yeah, I think that okay, that that makes sense. So essentially, two inputs that allow you to control the fire and smoke and ultimately flavor that you're well, one on. input, one output. Yeah, yeah, you know. But I'm talking about user input, like what you can do as the user of the smoker to affect. The yeah, and I think that's just, I mean, I, I tend to build, I tend to cook more where I utilize the speed of the fire and my firewood selection and placement, and that's, that's my variable. Got it. You know, that's like a little race car game. If you want more articulate heat, you move the wood forward in the, towards the smokestack is what sure. I call forward. Um, forward in the cook chamber, let the coals do, do their thing. If you need a less articulate, like a softer heat um, that's maybe less efficient, then you can pull it back and let some of that heat come out the backside because the vacuum's less towards right. the back. So you find that balance in airflow. Um, and that's what we were talking about, like windy days and stuff like that. That's kind of when those come in, yep. like how you would change your fire a little bit. Or if you notice, if you're cooking, say 27 briskets on a thousand gallon cooker and you notice that the you know, there's maybe one spot that doesn't, isn't getting as much heat. You could guide that heat a little bit. You could decide if it's hotter on the backside or the front side, or if it's hotter over here by how you do your fire. Hmm. This is next level barbecue witchcraft I, I'm, I'm not really <laughs> familiar with. I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever attempted to, to get one half of the cook chamber to be hotter than the other. Well, oh. but hotter is loose terminology too, okay. because you've got airflow at play and that's really yeah. what's cooking everything. Yep. It's yep. not, then it's not heat necessarily. Yeah, and if heat. it was heat, is it wet bulb, dry bulb? How do you gauge True. that temperature? Well, that was certainly fun. Thanks for watching. If you have any more questions, you can leave them in the comments down below. And a big special thanks to Jeremy Yoder. You can check him out at Mad Scientist Barbecue. And we'll see you next time.